welcome back everybody to another week at Beyond the Trailer Park. There I am. <laughs> yes, you're there. <laughs> Yay. So, uh, this week, um, there I am. <laughs> it was being a little pokey there. Uh, Beth is being invaded by the Canadians again. I'm sorry, Beth. A friend of mine, Ali Rizvi and Alushba Zarmin. Welcome to the show, guys. Hi, everybody. Hey. They're coming to us from Tirana. <laughs> and I, I have to say, um, you guys are sitting on your sofa, which those of you out there who know, there's a running joke about my accent and how I say the other word for sofa that I'm not going to get into right now. But yes, that's where they're sitting, guys. Yuck it up later, okay? <laughs> so... Ali and uh, Alishba, they are from Toronto, as I say, but they both, um, I know, Alishba, you were originally from Pakistan, and Ali, you were as well, or you've lived everywhere, so it's hard to say exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually originally Pakistani. My parents okay. were Indian, they moved to Pakistan, I was born in Pakistan, and then uh, when I was like five or six months old, we took off, and then we went all over the place. So, yeah, whereas Alishba, I think, stayed there for a while. Yeah, I moved. Uh, I moved to Canada when I was 17. I went to United World College in Victoria, BC, and uh, I spent two years there. Then I went to the U.S. I went to Indiana. Then I went to uh, Northern Ireland and UK. I studied Irish politics there. Then I went back to Indiana. I finished my um, degree over there, and then. Um, and Meanwhile, I was everywhere in California doing internships there and all sorts of fun things. <laughs> so, yeah. Sounds like it. Yeah, and you know what? You're, you're ahead of me. I've never actually been out west. So, you've been in BC. <laughs> I have not. And I was born here, so that's pretty sad for me. <laughs> oh, I haven't been there either. Like, he's been living in Canada for I don't know how long now, and he's never been to BC. I actually have never been. Uh... Like, he has no problem. idea what he's missing. <laughs> okay, well, I, I don't feel like such a dork now because <laughs> Ellie hasn't been there either. So this is good. <laughs> I've been east, though. I've been to PEI, and I've seen, like, the, the red dirt over in PEI. That, that's kind of trippy, but awesome. So, yeah, you guys have uh, been all over the place and, and done lots of things, and now you guys are pretty outspoken um, atheist and ex-Muslim uh, activists in Canada. So it's really, uh, I got to see both of you at the non-conference uh, back in uh, yeah. November. You both uh, spoke and entertained us quite well, so that's very cool. So, Ali, I know you actually um, spent a number of years in Saudi Arabia, which I, I imagine was quite an experience. What was that like? Um, it was, for me, growing up there, it was it felt normal because that's all I knew was growing up there. Um, so, yeah, at the time, I mean, it, uh, you know, it's, and we were pretty protected. Like, my parents were both professors. Um, mm -hmm. We were foreigners, so we didn't really mix with the locals. They don't like that. Um, a lot of the, uh, the sort of the expatriate community and the local community, they don't like the mix with them. So, um, yeah, we had, uh, we went to a private American school uh, there, so... You know, there was a, it was kind of strange because it was in the house. It was a Pakistani household. At school, when we went there, all of our friends and our teachers were all American um, and actually international people from a whole bunch of different countries. And then, you know, when we went out in the city to the shopping malls and everything, you know, it was local Saudi customs. So I had to get a male driver because women couldn't drive, uh, you know, right. covered and so on. So and all the other stuff that you hear. So it was... Mm -hmm quite a uh, mix of different things, and I just grew up, I mean, that was the world to me. I grew up, and I knew that was quite normal. And so that sort of mix of cultures and everything very early on. Right. And, Elishma, what was that like uh, for you being in Pakistan? Were you more in a, a Muslim area of Pakistan, or is that is it sort of pocketed like that? Um, I grew up in Karachi, so it's one of the yeah. Cities in the world, and it's very cosmopolitan. Um, Pakistan is slightly better than Saudi Arabia in the sense that there is no compulsory head covering for women. Um, you, like, legally, you 
are allowed to wear whatever you want, but uh, pretty much, you know, if you wear even something that's slightly form-fitting and you're by yourself, you are going to be harassed, sexually harassed, um, if you're by yourself. Anyway. That's the reality of the country, um, but legally there is no restriction like that. Women can drive, they can uh, go for elections. Um, one of, uh, mm -hmm. Pakistan was the first Muslim country to have a female prime minister, um, and things yeah. like that. So, so legally, it's there's not as much of a thing. The only uh, big hurdle legally for women in Pakistan is that um, if you are a rape victim, then you have to provide for eyewitnesses in accordance they with the, that. Wow. In accordance with the uh, Sharia law, and uh, DNA evidence is not um, entirely admissible without those uh, factors. Um, and what? Yeah, so it it's so it's it's pretty it's pretty challenging that way, and um, the same thing goes for um, premarital sex um, and homosexuality punishable by death. Um, so you have to, uh, those laws there. Uh, so that's 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 those those legal hurdles are there. But overall, it's less legally strict than Saudi Arabia. Um, it's not it's not pursued as much these charges, and if they are, um, they do come out of a lot of animosity, um, personal business and whatnot. Yeah. So there's a there's a whole thing about that. Um, and but there there are blasphemy laws and things like that. But growing up over there, um, I did not grow up in a particularly orthodox religious environment or community. Uh, the part the sect of Islam I was raised in is the most uh, reformist and the, probably the only reformist sect that currently exists. I can't speak too much about the theological uh, background because it will put a lot of people in danger, um, and I would hate to do that. Um, okay. So in, in, in public conversations, I try not to speak too much about the theological um, um, beliefs of the sect, uh, but um, having said that there was no restriction on me. I was encouraged to go to school, uh, say whatever I wanted. Um, in fact, a lot of uh, confidence and a lot of um, achievements that I have came out of my religious community and the dedication of volunteer teachers and their summer camps and their programs, which were very secular in nature. Um, the religion part only came in um, during specific prayers and whatnot, but overall it wasn't necessarily, you know, like God's going to send you to hell. Um, right. The concept of hell wasn't hellfire. The concept of heaven wasn't 72 virgins. It was all about, it was more like new age spiritual kind of thing. So it was never really uh, my belief um, at any point in my life to take those things seriously. Um, the the, the literal aspect, um, especially when it comes to Quran and all of those things. So I didn't get to actually read the Quran um, in entirety until um, until I came over here and that's when I was like, okay, I can't believe in that crap. So the basic premise, no matter how progressive my sect was, the basic premise was illogical that this book and particular individuals are, have authority over your life and they are the absolute truth. So the basic premise did not reconcile with um, objective logic, so I was just like, okay, I can't believe in that, so I'm just going to leave that part out and still go to my religious community when, whenever I can because I still have friends and all of those things mm -hmm. and enjoy the music and enjoy the food. Yes, it was a Muslim sect, but it was like, it was completely, there was there was no segregation concept between them. Right. So it was it was pretty different than Ali's uh, background. Well, what strikes me is that sounds an awful lot like your average Christian over here. That you know they grow up with it, and that's you know I I do that because everybody else does. And then, whoa, I read the Bible. What's that shit? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, it's very similar sounding. It's just as you say, it was just a Muslim sect, and is a difference. But yeah. well, very I mean interesting. One thing to point out is it has gotten worse. Like the even when I was growing up there, 
Um, and I spent some time when I went to university. I was in Pakistan, and uh, that was in the 90s. So it was kind of getting a lot of the sort of uh, the people that uh, uh, are what they call extremists. That's obviously a loaded term. You know, they that extremism was kind of increasing at that time. Yeah. So now, now I mean, now the situation is a lot worse. I mean, even like you know, the sects like uh, what um, um, Alish was talking about is like some of these sort of minority sects. I mean, they're all basically targets now. You have yeah. to be very careful. So that's that's one of the reasons I cannot speak too much about the theological difference in public. But I'd be happy to discuss. Yeah. I feel like saying like every time we say sects, we should spell it out. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, I know. I, f I feel the same the way. The sex is a target too. I mean, they don't like sex a whole lot there either. But that's just. No, they don't. They don't want anyone to have sex unless there's babies involved. I think. <laughs> I know. I and that that kind of goes with any any that the monotheists are really bad for that for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> it's that the, well that comes with the whole idea of one everything, one perfect thing, you know. So it's. it's when you're going to introduce an idea of singular perfection, you are going to get those very, very strict ideas around it. Yep, absolutely. But now it's, it's interesting to contrast the differences in, you know, your experiences, but then you both sort of came to the, the same place. So, so Ali, um, you, like you said, you didn't know any different. You were, you know, mainly in Saudi and that's what life was. And so when did you start to kind of wonder about this stuff? Mm, I started wondering about it right in the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. Like I did sort of like dabble in and out every time I had exams in high school. I'd get a little bit religious, you know, start praying before uh, the night before an exam, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, no, was that, guilty of that? <laughs> yeah, I was a bit of an opportunist when it came to my religiosity. Uh, but um, it, it started like actually when I was five years old. It was one of my earliest memories. I had a cousin um, who was three, and uh, she was she was in England. She's my aunt's daughter, and she had childhood leukemia, which you know we have a cure for now. But uh, at that time, it was incurable. So she was three years old, and I remember she was really sick. You know, her gums used to bleed, and, you know, she had all of those uh, usual symptoms. And then um, when she died, uh, she was in a room, and, you know, everybody was in the room. The entire family came in, extended family. Uh, her mother, who's my mom's sister, was there. My mother was there. Their younger sister was there. And I think I was talking to either my dad or my uncle. I can't remember clearly, but... Uh, they were all praying, and you know, a, a cancer death is horrific when you when you watch it. When it's a mm. three-year-old child, it's even worse. And this was she was three. She was she was like our playmate, you know. She was our cousin, and uh, so when she was gasping towards the end, then I asked, uh, I I I think it was my dad. I asked my dad. I said, you know, what's going on? And he's like, oh, Allah's taking her back. She's going back to God, you know. And I was trying to reconcile that. Because I'd always been told Allah was good. And uh, then I saw my, my mother and uh, her sisters, you know, and they were just sitting there. They had the Quran open. They were praying. They were reading it. They were crying and so on. And uh, I asked them, I asked my dad, I was like, so what are they doing? And he's like, well, you know, they're praying. They're essentially asking uh, God not to take her back. And it seemed like a tug of war. Like this two year old child in the middle, dying of cancer in her terminal moments. And... You know, God's on one side pulling her, and then on the other side, uh, her mother and her sisters are, are, are begging you know, for God not to take her back. So as a five-year-old kid, you know, you have a sense of clarity that's sort of uncorrupted, mm -hmm. untainted by a lot of the indoctrination that comes later. So, you know, that, that was the first time I'd say that, uh, uh, you know, the, there was an element of skepticism. I didn't know what skepticism at the time. But that's when it came in, because I thought, I was like, you know, this guy, what he's doing to this kid, despite the fact that his mother and everybody wants her to stay, um, it's like, you know, this guy seems like a sadist. You know, he seems like a complete yeah. asshole. And um, so that sort of sowed the seeds of doubt. And then when I, as I grew, I kind of noticed things like that. Whenever I'd see things on TV, like, I remember seeing that there was a plane crash and everyone in the plane crash died, except there was a copy of the Quran that was miraculously saved and unburned. Oh yes, I I've heard of that. 
And that, that, that you see that often. I've seen stories like that like throughout uh, when I was growing up. And I always used to wonder, I was like, why would God make so many copies of the Quran in the world? Why would he kill all these yeah. people? And just like, you know, okay, I'll just save this book. And, you know, I'd see that on TV, too. People would be thinking, like, the hurricane that wiped out, like, hundreds of people. There's one couple standing there. It's like, you know, well, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. He blessed us. And, you know, God saved us. We have God to thank for this. I'm like, you know, what makes you so special? And like, God didn't think that yeah. all these other people was special enough to save. So these are things, even as a kid, like, after that first incident with my cousin, when I was growing up, these I would kind of notice these little things. that, And I was actually surprised that nobody else noticed them. All the adults around, it just seemed completely. It seemed to make complete sense to them, for some reason. Because so. you can think of, you know, okay, God wants to take her home, but why does he have to do it in such a nasty, awful way? Like, yeah. that's a move. Like, even if you could kind of process the, okay, God wants to take his child back, but why does it have to be so nasty? You know. I, I read but. somewhere, and I I can't remember who said this. Um. There, yeah, there's someone who said, I, I don't know if it was Bertrand Russell, or I, I don't want to um, misattribute the quote to somebody, but um, you know, they said that if you really want to you know, d develop any doubts about religion, just go to a cancer ward in a pediatric hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, I yeah. remember seeing that, and I'm like, okay, well, that makes sense, because that was my introduction to skepticism you know, right there and then. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. So, what made you guys um, decide? You know, you know, you both came to the same conclusion: we're atheists, and we don't believe any of that hocus pocus stuff. What made you guys decide to start speaking out and and be more activists than just atheists? Well, um, I'm gonna start. Okay. Um, yeah. I, um, when I was growing up in Saudi Arabia, like I saw. I mean, there, there are many things, well, just to make a long story short, what happens is there's a lot of people um, in the places that I grew up in who are not able to say what they need to say, and many of them are victims of this ideology and uh, this sort of like all the religious lunacy. I mean, they're, they're victims of it. There are people who are not allowed to marry the people they want to. There are people who have to lose their lives or disown, you know, you know, all kinds of things just because of them. They don't have a voice, and they, you don't hear from them much because when they do speak out, you get what's happening to Raif Badawi, right, in uh, in Saudi Arabia. Yes. The blogger um, who's being flogged and who's in jail for ten years. Uh, so, you know, and and worse. I mean, you you hear uh, the people of uh, people being killed, people you know being beheaded for apostasy, uh, for uh, heresy, for all kinds of uh, ridiculous crimes. Um, or even, you know, in the place of Paris, you know, people being uh, bombed for, yeah. uh, you know, and killed for drawing cartoons of the prophet, or whatever they want to do to express themselves. So I... Well, I... I you know, sorry, go ahead. I, I was, I was going to say, I was listening to your um, interview with Joe Rogan and uh, yeah. the sorcery thing. I was like, holy crap, really? Sorcery? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very serious crime, though. It's uh, punishable by death, and they mm -hmm. have been. They, they are doing it as we speak. Well, the history behind is that yeah. the prophet was the victim of black voodoo magic, so that's why those things are real, because the prophet said those are real. Yeah, they're, they're considered to be uh, real in, in Islam, so, and pretty much in most of the sort of like mythological um, belief systems. Ah, the good old jinn. <laughs> jinn? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. I, 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 so I made myself a promise when I was younger that, you know, once I get into a position where I can speak, I will speak, and um, mm -hmm. that's that's what I'm doing now. You know, I, I just think I think the atmosphere is different. Uh, more people are speaking up. I, I was kind of very quiet about this for the longest time. I used to talk about it to family and everything. You know, just piss off the odd uncle yeah. uh, from time to time, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, so it was all sort of, in, you know, at home. But then, you know, I kind of, you know, when this really started picking up, and especially with the advent of the Internet and social media and everything like that, I think um, it became more outspoken because I thought it was necessary. And I think that there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of voices that were coming together and talking about it. Um, for Absolutely. me, it wasn't, it's, 
activism is not something new and for me it's not limited to religion it's more like mm -hmm. religion became a part of it um, well I, I have been an activist of some sort or another pretty much since I was uh, I don't know like fourth grade, fifth grade, something like that because um, I was very aware of women's rights around me because I lived in Pakistan and the kind of uh, domestic violence is a very, very big issue over there. So that was something that I was very, very vocal about and I was always volunteering. Um, so civil society and those contributions were very important to me, especially because I'd personally seen how much effect they can have on societies um, and especially communities. Um, my community was an example and the school that I went to, I went to Catholic school for 11 years and it was entirely the effort that we all used to put into our extracurricular activities, our volunteer work, that it was actually, it was, it was not the top ranking school, but it was a very, very tight community and something that I, a lot of my other friends who went to better schools in Pakistan, they don't have that uh, connection. So I it, that that wasn't like something I knew, but my first introduction to atheism was when I was 14, and my dad asked me to read Communist Manifesto. So that's like this. this <laughs> so here's one thing about Pakistan is very interesting that a lot of uh, old uncles, you know, like people my dad's age and stuff, they the ones who grew uh, up yeah, in the 60s. And yeah, 60s so on, and yeah. the 60s and 70s. Their introduction uh, to secularist, secular um, politics was basically communism, the communist Russia, before they knew what was actually going on with the Red Army, like what they were all about, because information did not travel as fast. So um, they were um, Marxist. A lot of these people, a lot of these communities are uh, to this day Marxists, and we find a lot of people who may say that they're religious and stuff, but they believe in Marxist politics, and mostly they're very poor people too. Mm -hmm. um, but they're right. very well versed in uh, politics and they're very intelligent people. So um, that was my dad's introduction to atheism and he was 17 at the time. And um, I was in school and I came home and I was talking about how my teacher said that, oh communists, uh, we, were, we were talking about something in our social studies class and then she uh, t told the class that communists don't believe in God. And then I told that to my dad, and dad's like, no, the correct word for that is atheist. It's not communist. Communist is politics. So, I, so from a very early age, I had this, you know, I knew the difference between identities and politics and beliefs and all of those things were very clear to me. Um, so that was my first introduction. But at that time, I was more into science, hard sciences. I wanted to be a genetic engineer, and I wanted to... Uh, like the thalassemia, uh, it's, a, it's a very big problem because of cousin marriages in Pakistan. So I wanted to do all of those things. Uh, so I was very, very scientific um, person back then. But I was still, I was still believe, I was still a believer in God, but more like a mystic sense, um, Sufi, right. um, comic sense, but not necessarily five times a day prayers and things like that. Those weren't. Those were never. I was never introduced to those things, and my practices were different. Um, so that was never a yeah. part of my thing. But then, um, after I came over here, I was exposed to things other than my home and my city where I grew up, and I saw the world, and it was it was pretty good, and I was learning a lot, and um, I was challenged uh, by a very dear friend of mine. Um, I was called stupid once because I was like, well, evidence, well, beliefs don't require evidence. You can have belief and that's okay. And he was just like, I don't know what to say after this. And I was like, you're stupid. <laughs> so I was like, well, I'm not stupid. So I was like, before questioning, I'm going to have to reevaluate and see where I was wrong. And then I was just like, okay, yeah, that was a pretty stupid statement. So I yeah. went back. You'd rather and say that the name-calling is not a good approach to out outreach. No, no. It worked on me. <laughs> 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 Like sometimes when I see like very, very outrageously ridiculous comments coming from people who are otherwise capable of being logical, I am not ashamed to be like, okay, you're stupid. I think that Edomino has its time and place and it can be very effective. 
Um, I, I'm a little bit different. <laughs> and, but, and, you know, it has worked. It is very entertaining. It does thing, work. But, but it here's is the effective. thing. You need, you need both, right? You need PC people and you also need You're product. right. You're right. absolutely right. I, I've been in that discussion with people before, and I am I try not to... I don't know. I kind of tailor my approach to the person, but I have been known to go off on somebody and say, you know, exactly what I think. And, yeah. and sometimes I think nah. the harsher, the harsher for what? You don't think I do that? No, she's kidding. <laughs> no, I think that's you know, that. Even on Twitter. I, I actually yeah. was very uh, influenced by Hitch and Stu because he used to do that too in a very, very classy way, and it worked every single time, right? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was one of those things. Yeah, but like I did not start. Uh, my activism about secularism um, until I went to Northern Ireland mainly because I was never personally affected in a traumatic way by religion like I don't have necessarily like you know um, like the sad story about my past and religious beliefs and whatnot I was never surrounded by negative uh, people or negative beliefs or something that restricted me um, apart from yeah. you know, like there are certain things you shouldn't question. Uh, even then, that wasn't like basically like I was never told those things explicitly. Um, I was always encouraged to question. So those were the things like I couldn't I couldn't empathize with the um, personally with the uh, scary part of religion until I became vocal and I experienced a lot of blasphemy charges and whatnot. But then I went to Northern Ireland and I saw that physical walls between Catholic and Protestant homes yes. and then my host mom um, she was Catholic and she married a Protestant and she showed us oh, how she used to get letters written in blood um, about like death threats written in blood right so yeah. I was, okay okay if I'm being this you know socio-political activist and I'm not talking about religion I'm actually not helping much because that is a big part of the problem, so I have to address that too if I want to address the entire issue of human rights. A lot of, people, a lot of people nowadays, they equate, you know, terroristic and terrorism and bombing and whatnot, oh, that's Muslim. For me, that was Irish people yeah. growing up. That's what we used to see on the news all the time. Oh, was I'll just say Timothy McVeigh. Oh, well, Timothy McVeigh, yeah, too. <laughs> I remember that too. But when I was a kid, you know, you I was like, Oh, there's another bomb went off in Northern Ireland again. You know, and that that was what we grew up with. So Where yeah, that, that makes well, sense. Well you grew up all here, right? But generally are you yes. Irish by um, um yeah. Well Scottish, Irish and English. So yeah, that's 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 my peoples. <laughs> But yeah, and and like my family has been in Canada since like the 1830s, so we're we're pretty Canuck as it goes, <laughs> and so nobody would be like, ooh, that's the homeland. But I've always been kind of a an Anglophile, and and I'm a history nerd, and that's kind of where I I know more history about. But I just remember that being as like a little kid, you know, five six years old, watching the news with my grandma going. Why are these people blowing themselves up or blowing each other up? And I, I don't understand. Like, you know, because here, you know, we go to church, we go to this church, you go to that church, and nobody gives a shit. Yeah. Over there, it's like, you're a Catholic, I'm going to blow you up. Like, eh, I don't. Sounds so familiar. Like, to this day, uh, when I used to walk to my campus, my university campus um, from home in Northern Ireland. I was in Derry or London Derry, depending on which side of the conflict you, <laughs> you emphasize with. So I call it Derry because a lot of my friends or native Irish they're like, don't call it London Derry. So um, yeah. I, I used to cross. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was it was very fascinating. Um, so yes, I used to cross uh, two schools, and they were the same schools, like the structure, like they were just like across, like literally like cross each other's. Well, one was Protestant and the other was Catholic. So the way they drain funds off the province um, is that if one school closes down because the government doesn't have funds to support it anymore, then they demand that the other, other um, the opposition must be closed down too. If they open a new school because there is demand and there are a lot of kids and they can't contain them in one particular school, they have to open another one 
even if there are only two kids going there just because of the divide, right? So it's pretty it's pretty ridiculous that like to this day they refuse to even go to school with each other and I'm just like, okay, I grew up in Pakistan and I've never like I've never personally experienced anything like that. I went to a Catholic school and I uh, really, really hated one of the nuns who was my headmistress, but other than that I really did not have any issues. Yep. Um, so I, it was very interesting for me because it was the first time I was seeing physical segregation at, at a school level. Um, and if it doesn't happen in Pakistan, I was like, why? Why is it happening in white people land, right? So it was, it was pretty interesting. And that kind of pushed me over the edge. And that's when I, I was like, I'm going to Google CFI. And then, like I was like Googling uh, secular institutions, secular organizations in the U.S. And I got introduced to SSA and CFI and all of these awesome places. And that's when I started writing and doing lots of things because I was like, if I have to, um, I have all of these examples and I can compare these things. And if, if there's there's no way religion is not doing any harm. How did the uh, nuns take having a, a Muslim in a Catholic school? That must have been kind of trippy for them. Well, there were there were some of the seventy two virgins. Right? The, <laughs> oh, oh, we were ninety percent ninety percent of us were Muslims in the school. Um, it was run by uh, the Catholic Church, and there's a very big Catholic community in Pakistan, actually. And um, I went to the school, one of the bigger churches, um, and it's been, I think the school's been, the church has been around for about 120 years right now, or something like that. Um, so it was founded by the British when they invaded and all of that kind of stuff happened. So a lot of yeah, like, Kar Karachi's got a lot of uh, we, uh, sort of Catholic schools, Catholic right? schools and Zoroastrian schools, um, the Zoroastrian community. In Karachi, um, they're dwindling, dwindling now. They're moving, obviously, because nobody is safe there anymore. But um, they had some of the best schools in Pakistan, uh, historic best schools in Pakistan, were founded by Catholics and Zoroastrians. And it's like every kid's, every parent's dream to send their kids to those schools, especially because they also um, uh, have segregated campuses. Um, right. So you know, it it fits right in with the Muslim um, idea of segregation and whatnot. But you also get very good education. So a lot of my teachers were the uh, British expats who never went back after um, after Pakistan India division, uh, but they were British, um, the original colonizers. Um, but I owe a lot to them because they basically taught me how to. I at that time I hated it. I, like I'm, you know, I have no problem with like you know people wanting to sit however they want, but I love the way they taught me. Like this is the way you should be sitting. This is the way you should be putting your feet together. This is the way you should be walking. You know, so it it, it was it was very graceful. I really I, I used to get annoyed at times because they were very constant, but I think it really really prepared me to be out there and how to make people because a lot of the things are dependent on the way you talk and the way you walk like it, it, it the oh, kind yeah. of people you want to speak to and all that's kind of you know it, it, it has an impact and that's something we can't run away from so a lot of etiquettes and all of those things so it was so it was, it was actually nice but there were some nuns who were just like really hardcore and you know everybody I talked to they, we all hated some of them but most of them were very, very good people who had a very big influence in character building. It was, it was good overall. <laughs> cool. Well, let's take a quick break, and it's time for the creation moment of the week. And we will continue talking uh, when we come back. It's about uh, seven minutes this week. Let me get my screen sharing happening here, and we will be all good because my computer is being... Persnickety again. Oh, and I do actually now have a second screen, so it makes this a little easier than it did. Oh, it helps if I share the right thing. The nice thing is I can edit all this out before I put the audio up. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, so anybody who wants to donate me a new computer, that would be cool. Because <laughs> what do you have? There we go. 
still makes shapes in the human mouth. It's chewy, easy to digest, and it's even curved toward the face to make the whole process so much easier. I choose to believe that the earth is young. When we do that, when we understand that creation is the truth, then we understand where all of our doctrine comes from as well. I just want to let you know that there actually is a book out there that actually tells us where matter came from. Uh, Bill, I do want to say that there is a book out there. So next time you hear on television somebody say millions of years ago, what's the question we're going to ask them? Were you there? Were you there? Call them up on the telephone and say, excuse me, Mr. TV man, were you there? The only way we could know what happened in the past if someone was there to tell us. That's right, dinosaurs live beside people. And of course, you'll have an evolutionist who'll say, that's not right, dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. What do you ask them? Were you there? Welcome to Creation Moments, a little slice of creation silliness that I get in my email every day, and I'd like to share it with you so that we can all get a taste of just how crazy creation shit is. On this week's Creation Moment, we're going to talk about self-esteem, or narcissism, or self-esteem, or... Ugh, Taylor's really fucking confused this time. Let's just... Listen. Pop psychology has for years declared that troubled young people, especially those who become violent, suffer from low self-esteem. But three studies released in the summer of 1999 conclude the very opposite. Young people who become violent have too much self-esteem. I'm starting to think Taylor doesn't think anyone who listens to his tripe knows how to read. Of course I looked this up. Not only is he using data from 1999 again, but inaccurate data too. There are a number of studies from that time period, and the majority of them reinforce the connection between low self-esteem and violent behavior. Interestingly, I couldn't find any of the studies that Taylor is talking about. Only one old Toronto Star story that references the three studies, but even that story is no longer available. This means I can't even examine the methodology that was used. However, that might not even be necessary. Just listen. One paper was published by the American Psychological Association. Researchers studied 540 undergraduate students. After answering standard questions designed to measure self-esteem and narcissism, the students were put into different situations. They were given the opportunity to act aggressively against someone who had praised them, or insulted them, or did nothing to them. Researchers found that the most narcissistic students were the most likely to react but the narcissist against anyone who had offended them. Did you hear that? Narcissism! That's a hell of a lot different than self-esteem from accomplishments, value, and care for others. Narcissism often comes from fear, failure, or weakness, focus on the self, and an unhealthy drive to be seen as the best, as well as deep feelings of insecurity and inadequacy. In short, whether they realize it or not, the narcissist is overcompensating for very low feelings of self-worth, not in excess of it. So right away, Taylor is way off the mark here. The one abstract I could find regarding the outcome he mentions even goes one step further. It was measuring narcissistic personality disorder, which is a pathological extreme of narcissism to the point of being a cataloged mental disorder. That's a far cry from what Taylor is trying to imply here. I am almost afraid to keep listening. Another study found narcissism is have been convicted of rape, murder, assault, armed robbery, and similar crimes. When their self-esteem was measured against the general population, it was found to be above average. The researchers involved in this study pointed out rehabilitation. In this, they concluded is definitely the wrong approach since such people already have an inflated view of themselves. The Bible warns against narcissism and many of the problems in our society today are undoubtedly the result of this condition. Again, he's confusing So not the same thing. Remember also, narcissism is usually a symptom of severe insecurities and low self-esteem. Oh, and get this, they have a photo here of Jeffrey Dahmer, undoubtedly to try and imply that so-called high self worth serial killer. Boy, did they choose the wrong example. Dahmer was one of the few serial killers to be extensively interviewed and studied before he was killed. 
And guess what? He had an extreme level of self hatred and insecurity. He began killing his victims as almost a side effect of trying to keep them with him, possess them, and in his mind, not be alone. He felt that everyone would leave him if he didn't do something to prevent it. That's the complete opposite of what Taylor is trying to say. You know, they really fabricate shit about what makes people into criminals and sociopaths. First it was tattoos, now it's self-esteem. Why do they do this? Well, the church has an interest in making people feel guilty and shitty about themselves. They need you to think that you've got the proverbial illness so they can sell you the cure. So they trot out dumbass ideas like sin or that self-esteem and pride are evils to be avoided so that you will continue to think you're a piece of shit and need to be saved by Jesus. It's the kind of bullshit that really pisses me off. The prayer even hints at this ulterior motivation. Father, it is enough for me that you love me enough to save me. Save you from God, of course, who was such a shitty creator that he made something infinitely inferior that his creation has to keep begging for forgiveness forever. Nice, eh? So in other words, Jesus decided to take pity on your sorry ass. So just kiss his and don't bother trying to love yourself first. Well... Learn to value, love, and appreciate yourself first, and you will be able to do the same for others so much more effectively. <sighs> and that is the truth. Enough bullshit fake psychology for this week. Join us again for another creation moment. <laughs> You're starting to sound like me. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So, so Ali and Alicia won't know about this, but this is um, a creationist mailing list that a friend of me mine got me uh, signed up for an email shit that they send. Like they they have the recording you can go listen to it on their website too. Don't up with they just like oh somebody. Oh, said this happened. Mhm. Mm yeah, I think. Uh, Go ahead. Yes, oh no, no, I was just saying you just got choppy for a second, but I think you're okay now. Okay. Okay. So yeah, we uh, we like to make fun of those guys every week because they're pretty ridiculous. Like yeah. one of the first ones I did, they were going on about how great this uh, frog's um, reproductive um, mating system was and I went and looked it up and the frog is extinct. Yeah, good success. As, right. I, as I should um, probably sign you up for one of the Islamic uh, mailing lists. Oh my god. If you think like that's bad, oh. just wait till you see some of those things. They're, they're oh, that'd be good. Yeah, yeah. They're horrid. yeah, you'd you'd probably like that one, Dev. <laughs> I probably would. I I've had a couple of um, when I first opened my Facebook, my heathen Facebook, I was just accepting anybody's friend request because I really didn't give a shit, and I inadvertently ended up with a bunch of Muslims on there because, well, look at my avatar. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that doesn't get much more haram than that, but whatever. And and so I occasionally, there's one in particular, I think he thinks that I can be converted or something, but every once in a while he'll tag me in this ridiculous um, picture like the first one was uh, seven steps to better pray to Allah or something, and I'm like, dude, what part of I'm like raging atheist do you not get? He's like, oh, I know, but that's why I tagged you. I'm like, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then the people on their friends list get pissy when I'm like, but it's all made up bullshit, and they're like, don't say that, Allah. <laughs> you know what I don't understand is that all of these religious people, especially um, like the Islamic faith, the, the, the belief is that um, when there are only like a few hundred believers left, um, uh, the Jal, is, is the Antichrist, uh, would come and then uh, Jesus is going to reappear because Muslims don't believe that he was crucified and he was uh, lifted up by God. So what 
Christians believe as resurrection, Muslims believe as a reappearance. So, like, all of these awesome things are going to happen, and, like, you know, God's glory is going to be become evident, then why would you want people to be, still believe? Like, wouldn't you want more people to be heretics so you can have your amazing, glorious yep. miracle of, like, bringing back dead mythical feats. Oh, and you know, like it's it's just it's just very interesting <laughs> that how that that cognitive dissonance works. Well, and and someone to take care of your pets. Do you know about that? The uh, uh yes, that's <laughs> one of my the favorites. For, a group. Yeah, the rapture. Yeah. No. Just for people who don't know, there's a guy who decided to start a business. Well, he said that because your animals are not going to be able to go to heaven with you oh, Lord. during the rapture, <laughs> uh, give me some money and I will take care of your animals when the rapture happens. And he actually got a lot of clients. So. He did. He got. It was around uh, when Harold Camping's, uh, well, I can't say first because he actually predicted three other times prior to two years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. His, first, his, his May prediction and then he shifted it till October. Yeah. yeah, he made quite a bit of money because people fell for it. If Deepa I mean, you gotta, you gotta give him credit. <laughs> if Deepa Deepa I thought he was a bestseller author. I do not find this surprising. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. He's had a traditional myth behind it <laughs> instead of just like made yeah. up bullshit that connects quantum uh, physics. No. Quite like, like off the he's the king. <laughs> The king of word salad. Like, I want to send the oh, guy God. a cake with your dressing. <laughs> yeah. Actually, if he was smart, he would start marketing Deepak Chopra's salad dressing. He should totally do that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, you know, like, if, you, if you'll see um, a lot of uh, peaceful Hindus, um, they're great, I mean, in the sense that, like, you know, they don't believe in killing or anything like that, but a lot of their basic ideas, what Deepak Chopra is doing, he's just injecting some um, scientific words into exactly the kind of ridiculous nonsense that exists in uh, polytheistic beliefs of uh, East India. Yeah. Have, you, have you seen there's a, a Deepak Chopra a generator website? Oh, oh yeah. Thanks. Brilliant. I love that. <laughs> it's very similar to postmodernist article generators. I read too where somebody asked him if he knew about it. He's like, oh, yes, flattery is such a, a nice compliment, you know. I wish them well. I'm like, well, that's good at least. <laughs> oh, God, oh man. But Another one of our favorites is that whole um, Ben Affleck kerfluffle. And I know, Ali, I love listening to you talk about that. <laughs> you have a really good take on that. And my favorite expression is the afflectation. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, this has become like a, a term. I think I said that just, I, I sometimes, you know, you just say things and they take hold and you never know. But, yeah, that's what it was. Yep. Afflectation or an afflection, you know. Yes. Some people suffer from certain... Aspects. But I think it, <laughs> it's it's so important, though, and I know you and, and Faisal get out there and talk about, you know, we can't let people intimidate you with this whole Islamophobia bullshit because an idea is an idea, and an idea is not a person. Yeah. And I think that is just so important for people to, to try and understand. It, it gets out of hand. Yeah, and I think that's it enough. I, I find it, uh, you know, it, it can be a little, you know, saying it over and over again. I mean, it's just off it, that it's such a difficult concept to get through to a lot of people until they get it, and when they get it, it makes complete sense. But, I mean, that's the thing. Uh, criticizing ideas, ideas don't have rights. You know, they're, um, they're not entitled to respect, necessarily. Uh, the uh, human beings do have rights, and they are entitled to respect. So... To make that distinction is actually very important, and I and I always find Ali, that you know that's. Go ahead. I was going to say, do you think some of the misconception or the misunderstanding is where I live? We call it pencil tucky. It's they're not the smartest people, <laughs> and one of the misconceptions, and I uh, 
I even don't even know how to even approach it, is that they're conflating being Islam, being Muslim, with it actually being people. They don't understand that it's a religion or in some some people will go so far and I kind of lean towards this that it's a, a, a mixing of political ideology with religion mm -hmm. and they're they're confusing it with you know someone who is Islam they're believing that Islam is the people or is the person it's a lot of overcompensation too for you know the white man's guilt a lot of that's going on over yeah. there and a lot of these people actually sympathize with the idea that uh, we should respect all religions, right? So it's it's one of those things that their um their 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 soft corner or their leniency is not restricted to Islam, but they would extend the same um, lack of a better word courtesy to other beliefs too. And the only way to counter that is that if you believe that uh, we shouldn't disrespect other people's belief, then Nazism was also a belief, and a lot of slavery is yeah. a belief, right? So to use those examples, like where belief was um, the main reason a lot of uh, uh, groups suffered uh, human rights abuse, that is the that is the most effective way that I've found. But speaking specifically about Islamic um, religion and Muslim people as separate entities, it's something that they have to. Um, it's 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 something that you have to be a little bit older than a college freshman. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> like a lot of the times, you know, they're they're very sweet. But, you know, like I I can I can see because I was surrounded by them. I went to a very hippie Quaker um, private school in Indiana, so I I understand that they have the best intentions at heart and they are like they want to be the champions of world peace but these very um, the, the, these very important intellectual distinctions uh, you have to uh, just place it in an academic context and that's the better way to um, address that and for the rest of the world you can just use these horrible atrocities that they um, made happen. Yeah I'll, I'll actually just getting to what you were saying, Beth, you know, just to talk about something a little bit. In a lot of ways, I'm Islamophobic, right? And like, if I, I you know, the Raif Badawi has a good, very good reason to be Islamophobic because, you know, he's over there. If he says the wrong thing, like if I blaspheme, if I do anything, then in certain the places that I grew up, you know, if I'm not executed by the government, I'm going to be executed by the mob. So there's very good exactly. for me to, to be uh, scared of the idea. Phobia is an irrational fear. I think that in this case, a fear is rational. On the other hand, right. I also have brown skin. I came from Pakistan. I grew up in those parts of the world. Mm -hmm. I have a Muslim name. I come from a Muslim family. So I have also, um, like, you know, one thing that I've also experienced is I've also experienced the anti-Muslim bigotry because I fall within yeah. the same group of people, I and mean, that's a society that I was raised in, right? Um, so I, I know that that's also a very real thing, the anti-Muslim thing. So, so we're kind of caught, that to me is, uh, you know, this is just like personal evidence. I mean, it should show very stark mm -hmm. there is a difference between criticism of Islam, right, and, and having a fear of the kind of behavior that certain beliefs can lead to mm -hmm. in, yeah. versus, you know, actually uh, being... A, a victim of prejudice or a target of prejudice right. by people who hate certain people. So th there is mm -hmm. that's, that that distinction is actually very important to make. And one one more thing that I'd like to say here is I think that uh, it's a and I've said this many times. I think it's an insult and an injustice to genuine victims of anti-Muslim prejudice when mm -hmm. people exploit their experiences and their pain in order, like, for the political motive of stifling any criticism of Islam. Exactly. When you... No, I, and see, and, and, and I'll be honest, I mean, I, I'm struggling with this because um, my my social network is online. <laughs> so yeah. when I, like, even attempt to talk about this, I, it's just, I swear, swear to God, I am, like, talking to a fucking brick wall. And yeah, yeah. it kind of it kind of brings in the situation with Rafe, is that 
I don't know how to explain to them in a non... I don't even know what the word I'm looking for. Why, I mean, besides the human rights issues, just by themselves, the fact that you don't hurt other people, is how to explain that what he's going through is wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's where, like, that's my... I, I, think, I just I can't I can't wrap my head around it. And I, I struggle with it. <laughs> just, like someone asked, someone asked me point blank, "Well, why is what he's what you know? Why is what he's going through? Why is that wrong?" I mean, disregarding the human rights issue, and it's like I can't explain it. That is a tough thing to wrap your head around. But I I gotta say, like you know, when I was growing up, and uh, it's kind of it's so hard for people here to understand. But uh, when mm -hmm. you're, you're you're raised with these values, I mean, I remember I I know when the Salman Rushdie incident happened. You know, I was in I was almost in, I think I was in high school then, and um, there were a lot of people saying you know that this guy you know what he's done is t terrible and you know he should uh, you know he should be executed or you know he should be punished or My whatever. My mom it is. said that too. Yeah, like, no. And you know she is she is a very reasonable woman and she loves me even though I'm an mm -hmm. atheist and stuff. And she and people, she has no issues with me now, but back uh, back then she yeah. although she had no idea what he had written about because there was Mo most people didn't. Yeah, most, it's, it's just like the Quran, right? Nobody knows what it's like. Well, it's all good. It's all like it's God's words. But, but they, I. I think that one of the ways to explain this is, and I remember, you know, you know, being raised that way, you know, I didn't completely agree with it. I thought it was a little ridiculous, but I did understand where they were coming from, and here's why. So what happens is that uh, Islam for a lot of these people, and you'll see this when you see with, well, let's start with this, like, you know, ex-Muslims. The, the experience of ex-Muslims a lot of times is that when they leave their religion, they don't just find them uh, themselves with a different ideology. It's not like they just change their mind about their beliefs. They often lose mm -hmm. and ostracized from their culture. Uh, they're mm -hmm. sometimes right. suicide. They're disowned by their families. They have to give up their community. They can't visit the same countries they grew up in, and or they lose their heads. You know, literally. Um, they yeah. get so there's yeah. so the thing that kind of goes to show, and they, a lot of them go through a lot of depression. They feel. Uh, alienated, mm -hmm. or isolated. They feel uh, they feel a sense of fragmented identity, and that's the thing. They're, you know, the, in in the Muslim world, a lot of times Islam becomes a part of these people's identity, it becomes a part of their family identity, mm -hmm. their group identity, and their individual identity. So they find that fragmented. You know, when they lose the religious aspect, that's something we've seen with ex-Muslims. Now, try to think of it from you know this integration of identity and belief. When people have that, mm -hmm. often when you criticize their beliefs, they see it as an attack on their identity. Them. Right? Them. So, yeah. And, th and they're wrong. They're wrong about that. You know, but it is understandable. Like, I do understand why they feel that way. And we yeah. can all understand how they feel that way by seeing the experiences of ex-Muslims and, you know, what they go. Or people, you know, coming out of any religion. Like, you know, religion is just very tied into people's identities. So it's, it's very important for us to drive home the fact, even to them, that your identity is not the beliefs of your parents. You know, you that's have an identity right. that's independent. I mean, it's not something, it's something you create. It's not necessarily something... But that, even that very um, idea is offensive, that your identity is not connected to your parents. That's, that's something that does mm -hmm. not go with the cultural beliefs that your existence has to be tied in with your family, your religion, and your country. Well, if I'm going in order, your religion, family, and country, that that's the order it goes in. Um, so, you know, these are the things you should be able to give your life for. You should be, um, you know, if it, if it comes down to sacrificing your in everything that makes you happy because those uh, three factors want something from you, you should go ahead and do that. A very common example in all Abrahamic religions, the um, sacrifice of uh, Abraham. Like, you know, everybody's like, oh, like, he was ready to kill his son. Like, what a noble thing. Like, how does that make you any different than ISIS? 
right? Uh, they are doing the same thing. So yeah. you commemorating that particular event, glorifying that event, is mm -hmm. the same as glorifying anything and everything that I oh, think yeah. that jihadis are doing. So, I mean, yeah. right? so those things are also there. So like, to, to, so I, I, I don't like I, I, I disagree with you here. I don't think that's like a very good approach to tell them that you know your identity is different and all of that kind of stuff. But to um, use, no, 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 I, I'm not to use yeah. to use just labels and to explain and to define what each term means and that's another problem with the world in general that I've noticed. Yeah, but I, I'm, not saying, know, I'm not saying, I'm not actually saying that, I'm not saying that we should use that approach. No, 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 I'm just saying yeah. that, yeah, I, I understand. I'm saying a way to about. understand yeah. why they get, you know, because Beth was, you know, Beth, you were saying that, you know, it's really hard for them to understand. I'm just trying to, like, based on my experience growing up there, I'm trying to explain where a lot of that comes from when they don't understand, when they take it personally. And I, I have found, yeah. uh, I, when I've had these conversations uh, with people, with Muslims, I found that they're actually quite open to understanding, you know, like what I just said, that, you know, there's, there's a difference between criticizing ideas and people, and I understand why you bring the two together. I know why your identity is tied up with your religious beliefs, and I understand mm -hmm. all of that. But it's, it's a flawed thing to the world, yeah. Like like with with Christians, I think they've come to an evolution where you can kind of start to tease that apart because they often will come up with the old "you can hate the sin but love the sinner." So I like to twist that back yeah. on them and That's like, really well, okay, well I can hate the religion and like you, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I in some cases I'm not sure that the average mu Muslim is to that point yet. I think they're the religion hasn't quite evolved there. Another thing mm -hmm. they also say is that, oh, well, you like me is because my religion taught me to be this person that I am, which you like, mm -hmm. right? So that conjecture is like, it's, it's, it's interesting because then by that definition, you should also be attributing all the atrocities that terrorist group commit to Islam yeah. or to religion in general. Yeah. If you're attributing your good you good behavior to religion. Those people are inspired. Their bad behavior is inspired by religion as well. So why they wouldn't? Think it's good. Yeah. So that's the thing. So like every this this is this is this is the fun part, and this is like something that Pomo uh, people love, like C.J. Whirlwind and Reza Eslan and all of these people love. Yeah. This is why like it drives me nuts when people like that. Like I don't care like what. A half-educated, you know, a person living in a Pakistani village thinks Islamic belief is about killing, um, uh, killing homosexuals and all that stuff. But like, what these people are trying to uh, cover up, they're like, oh no, those are the people. Those people are wrong. Their idea is right. So I'm just like, okay, so you're like defending, uh, you're defending an idea at the expense of. Uh, people who you can inspire, who you can talk to, who you can inspire a change in their attitudes and whatnot. So that's 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 the thing that really gets to me that, you know, it's how, how why are you so stuck? I mean I understand why they are, but even after being exposed to so much of world politics and literature and ideas and people um, you are always going to have these uh, adamant people who will put their personal um, their personal lifestyle as the uh, representation of what the literature of the religion says. So this is one thing that I always tell them. I'm like, the way you're living your life is not what's written in the book. Like Ali was uh, giving this example earlier on that just because yeah. most Jews eat pork does not mean that pork is an okay thing in the Old Testament. It's not. Uh, it doesn't like just because Jews are eating pork doesn't mean that it's allowed or it's it's no longer a sin. It just means that you don't give a shit and you know that you can actually go to Pendulette's uh, bacon and donut party at ten. Like great, you can do that, right? So that's that's the best part about these things. But that doesn't mean that the religion is is that merciful, happy, and amazing thing. And that's that's the point well, yeah. you have to drive home. And when I, 
when I've had the, those guys on my Facebook, you know, I, I get all the Muslim guys on there, and one thing I keep getting told over and over again is, well, you know, the Quran says that we should give to the poor, and the Quran says that we should do all these nice things, and I'm like, you need a book to tell you that? What does that say about you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's true. There's always this uh, sort of uh, this answer to that, like, you know, every time you point out that there is, okay, there's a house that's burning down, right? Part of it's that's on fire, part of it's that's that not, on, not on fire. I'm like, okay, guys, this part of the house is on fire, all right? Let's focus on it. They're like, no, 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 let's focus on the part of the house that's not on fire. I don't find that very useful. I don't think it completely, uh, I don't think it uh, erases the fact that the house is burning. So there is, um, yeah, there is this tendency that whenever you point out things, be like, well, what about all the good stuff? And I'm yeah. thinking like that that would be okay if you were talking about a book by Thomas Jefferson um, yeah. or somebody who did not claim infallibility. But if you if you're making a case for divine authorship, then it has to be perfect on all accounts. Then if it's it, not, yeah. then that's the issue. And if it's not perfect, and if you're still thinking that those outdated ideas are perfect, then that's how you get ideas. Yeah, and you were you were talking about Facebook. I did something. Just for the fun of it, once because yeah. I was feeling you know, that was like in a trolling mood. It was a while ago. <laughs> so I found uh, these really nice quotes from Mein Kampf, like you know, inspiring quotes. You know, like leadership. About leadership. They the were actually person. quite good. Yeah, they were quite good. And I told somebody, yeah. and I posted it, and I said that these are from uh, Ali, the the first Imam of the Shias, and the fourth Caliph of the Sunnis. Like I was like. This is from Ali's yeah. book, and he had a book called Nacho Balaga. So I was like, this is from okay. Hatsup Ali's book, and these are amazing quotes. I got so many likes from all of these, like, sort of uh, Shia people. <laughs> I, I met it up. Sorry, guys, I had this wrong. It was actually from Hitler's Mein Kampf, but, but don't worry. You know, there's there's good things in every book, and maybe the rest exactly. of it. Exactly. And, that, and yeah. that's the thing, you know. It, it, just because somebody is an asshole doesn't mean that they can't have a good idea once in a while, too, you know? Or but just because I, they have an idea once in a while doesn't mean that doesn't they mean they're not an asshole. <laughs> yeah, they deserve a Nobel, right? That's, 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 well, that's, yeah, and I've gotten into that discussion with, with Christians and Muslims before where they're like, you know, I'm saying, okay, you're telling me this, I've heard this, you know, it's all about the same verse and nobody can agree well, how is a perfect deity not, like, how do they fuck this up? And they're, what do you mean? Well, it's not clear. You know, couldn't couldn't this perfect deity make something that everyone could understand all the time? Well, no, f because of free will. And I'm like, what? You, I've, got in a, I've got in a B on more clearly written papers than what God came up with, right? So God's yeah. <laughs> dissertation is something that is going to be rejected by any respectable academic institution if, uh, yeah. if somebody were to write it now, right? So it's one of those things I'm like, okay, so uh, a lot of books go through a more rigorous and thorough uh, mm -hmm. questioning and all of those things before they become a universally accepted textbook. And yep this thing that was written so many years ago by a single person in the case of Islam, apparently he couldn't read and write and it was actually passed down by oral tradition so you cannot even be sure that all of it was by one person over a particular period of time. You cannot even be sure about his authorship and you're willing to claim that a divinely inspired perfect thing for the rest of humanity. It was a really that? old game of telephone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a progressive yeah, transgenerational exactly. game. And then yeah. here's here's the thing, some some reformist sects will tell you that oh that Quran that was just uh, good for that time, but now it's the divine inspiration that is the yeah. certain imams or certain clerics who you know who speak on behalf of God and you know prophet who have the authority to translate these things. So I'm like, okay, so you're telling me that I can have a degree, um, you know, have a full scholarship, uh, read books that are a lot more difficult than anything uh, or an illiterate. Uh, uh, Shepherd could ever come up with um, is a po a poetic thing, uh, so I can read all of those other books, but I do not have the intelligence to read one 
shorter book compared to everything else that I've or I've read and understand it, and that I need yeah. someone who believes that he has to wear his pants like a few inches above his ankles and have like a beard longer, the beard <laughs> touching his pubes to tell me what yeah. what this book means. Like, are you I kidding know. me? That is like. Yeah. And when when I get you know when it says kill the non-believers and you need like you know three books to tell you why it doesn't really mean that like come on <laughs> and even if you give the context argument in which context is it okay to kill people just because they do not believe in what you're preaching like there's no context they're like oh it was the custom at the time well then oh. at the time it was slavery yeah, yeah. it's God yeah. was wrong. And that means that your entire premise is bullshit. I think Dan Savage said it best. Like he, he said that uh, when they were talking about homosexuality in the Bible, you know, he's like, "Well, the Bible's not a good way to go because the Bible got slavery wrong. So if there's a book that gets slavery wrong, I'm not gonna get my guidance about homosexuality and gay rights from that book." Period. And the and the most uh, and and mm -hmm. the only thing about slavery that uh, that is in Islam is that you should treat your slaves with kindness. Yeah. That means, so it doesn't outlaw slavery at all. It just except for the part of about taking them as slaves. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. You can take yeah. you, you take you can take non-believers who you um or who you conquer um as slaves and. The women as sex slaves, the concubines. You can. The Bible. The Bible says the exact same thing. In a yeah, I was just way. gonna say, and 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 that's the funny thing. If you look at both the Bible and the Quran and the apologetics for both, it's the same thing. Same, yeah. Okay. I mean, based on what you're saying, the some to me, like a, a simple way of putting it is they're they're using the context. Well, with Christian apologetics, they do it that. Oh, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You don't understand what it's written. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I, get that, I, I get that. I get that quite a bit because I do a lot, uh, a lot of counter apologetics, and it's like, I mean, that's what I went to uh, went to college for, right? For you know, Bible and theology, and yeah. it's like, well, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Well, when I studied this, I did. Yeah. Why do you think yeah. I left the religion in the first place? You haven't studied it enough, Beth, unless yeah. you agree with us. And yeah, you yeah. Right. You, well, and, and, you don't know what it means. Okay, this is going to sound like a really stupid question, but considering it's from me and I know very little about Islam, is there more than one version of the Quran like there is of the Bible? There no. was. Like, like, not currently. Not currently. That, then that leads my, to my next question. Is it true that at some point, and I don't remember when I'm pulling this out of my ass, so excuse me, that there were like different versions and they burned all those and then they came up with the one version? There are a lot of uh, stories about that. Um, there is no historic verification of any of those things, especially because one of the, the only people who had access to... Um, Quran were uh, the prophet's immediate companions, so they knew the mm -hmm. entire text um, as the thing goes. So they were the people who compiled the book, who revised, compiled, revised. So it took them. So it was. It was not until at least uh, fifty it's years. A month's time. It's fifty a month's years time. after, yeah, fifty <laughs> years after the death of the prophet, the book was actually compiled in writing for the first time. Um, now, right. um, there is a friend of mine. He does. Um, his name is Fling Shore. He, he does gin and tonic show, um, and a couple of other things. So he is. Uh, he's studying Islam, and he talks about all of that stuff. So we actually made. Um, a chart, a flow chart of uh, different revisions uh, Quran went through before coming down to the one book that, of course, all the Muslims are going to deny that because this mm -hmm. book is changing and is the only is is the one book that God has said that He will protect until the end of time. So if He, you know, if God has said so, it, it can't happen. Is well. It? The one, the one that I always get to is okay. So I've been told many times that number one, I'm misinterpreting the Quran because it's not in Arabic, 
Or number two, I misinterpreted oh, yeah. the Quran because I didn't talk to an imam first or some scholar. And I'm thinking, so Allah <laughs> could figure out that a good chunk of the world wasn't going to be able to speak Arabic. Well, exactly. I, I describe that in a certain, like, whenever I, I think a lot of uh, the sort of like the moderates and the, uh, the apologists, you know, they kind of have this idea. And I have a quote, you know, they say, put down that Quran and listen to me. That's basically yeah. what they're saying. Like, like yeah. my explanations for all of this stuff mm -hmm. um, are better than the word that God wrote Himself literally in the book. So, I, I mean, I think I think a book is uh, you read a book the way you read any book. Of course, there's historical context. Of course, you have to look at it that way. But most mm -hmm. of the people who tell you that you're not looking at the context, they don't know the context. Oftentimes, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> the context makes things worse. You know, yeah. like uh, a lot of times, you know, you'll see that uh, they will tell you, no, no, you're interpreting it wrong. This actually has a much better interpretation. What you're saying is much nicer, and it's, you know, flowers and bunnies and everything. But then, mm -hmm. when you actually read up on it, it's not flowers and bunnies. It's the exact opposite. My so. my favorite counter argument is that so I need to learn Arabic to counter the Quran, but you don't need to learn Arabic to know it's a divine book. Right, because yeah. most of these people, they have never <laughs> learned Arabic ever. Like they don't know what's in that book. They've never even bothered to read a translation. They haven't themselves gone to any imam and been like, "Can you explain every single verse?" You know, to be and mm -hmm. taking those. They, they they have never done any of yeah, those. Yeah, I've I've talked so, a lot of. Yeah, so yeah. Like, so you're gonna tell me that this book is perfect because you know your mom told you so, as opposed to me actually reading it. Uh, it's it, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna deal with that and like and I just wanted to say one more thing before we move on to an, another uh, point that as we uh, were talking about when we met last time in Toronto that um, about uh, Quran and uh, the Bible the overlapping why those things are there and why a lot of Sharia law a lot of those punishments like you know uh, cutting hand cutting the hands off and um, stoning and all of those things, they are not in the Quran, but why they are in the traditions of the Prophet, it's because um, he married, um, the, his first marriage was to a very, very wealthy uh, widow, she was a widow, right? A very wealthy widow who was about uh, 20 mm -hmm. years older than him, and she um, she was the one who gave him employment, and she made him her um, uh, her merchant uh, her, to represent her um, and he used to travel all across the Arabian region uh, where he was introduced to a lot of different religious uh, beliefs and traditions and th those traditions were also present in Mecca because it was the trade center and a lot of people used to come over there. Damascus a lot. Yeah. Time, yeah and Khadija's brother was um, a Christian priest and he taught um, he taught him all about Christianity, all about Judaism, the return of the Messiah, and all of those things. His uncle was so also Christian. His yeah. uncle was Christian too. Um, his he was surrounded by pagan mythologies, of the lunar calendar, and all of those things. So those things were all plagiarized. Um, you know, as like he would go in a cave and sit there and be like, "Oh, Gabriel came to me and told me to." Uh, preach this to the bad kind. So all of those things were directly um, plagiarized from all of these texts yeah. that he was exposed to before he announced his prophethood. No, I, don't, I don't think like, you know, with, with Muhammad it's interesting. Yeah, a lot of it is from, so the amputation is just a little thing. The amputation is in the Quran. The stoning to death isn't. But a lot of it actually comes from the Old Testament. And it's, it's because of the people he traded with in this professional relationship. Yeah. And I, I don't think he meant badly. For that time, uh, a lot of the changes he brought were actually very progressive for that time. So, you know, when we look at the founding fathers uh, of the U.S., like Thomas Jefferson, you know, he had a 14-year-old slave girl who he had a child with. You know, this is the, George. They were all slave owners, all the founding fathers. And we kind of, because they don't claim infallibility, we let that go and we look at their positive things. And we say, all right, we give that a pass because it was a very long time ago. Yes. And so I think it's the same kind of thing. The only problem is that he claimed infallibility. The book yes. is supposed to be infallible. So that is why, you know, prophets or people who claim prophethood um, do come under a lot more scrutiny. Because Absolutely. They have to be held to the standard. It's of classic danger. Machiavellian move. It's, it's you know, the yeah. prince in action. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
That's all but, it is. If you say uh, God, God told me so to do that. Um, you know, all of those things. It just makes your um, process a lot faster than doing what American Constitution says. You know, which Boehner kind of overlooks every now and then. But <laughs> you know, yeah. must no, have <laughs> you must That's must a you must have. <laughs> Sounds an awful lot like well of the people, um, you know the the um, the good majority, and then the process, the to get the lawmaking, um, all of those things, uh, representing people's wishes, and um, even the minority voices cannot be overlooked in uh, yeah. lawmaking. Right, those have to yeah. be included. It's not like the general will uh, is not the will of the majority, um, but the greater good and all of those very very difficult concepts you don't have to deal with that you don't have to invest the billions of dollars in your campaign all you have to say is God told me to do that and you have the GOP <laughs> <laughs> just gonna say no comment. The, way you, the way you put it with Muhammad there sounds like Joseph Smith you know because oh, yeah, absolutely and, and these guys like I don't think there has been an original monotheistic religion since the Aten you know in ancient Egypt mm -hmm. <laughs> like they just all steal from you know the 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 early Christians stole from every pagan they ever came across and like oh well, yeah that was really Christian and then you know the the everybody steals from the original Christians and it's like nobody has ever come up with anything original well, since. You know what's so. interesting is like the the, high, the god with the highest status in Hinduism is Brahma. And mm, his, yes. his partner was Saraswati. And uh, yes. there's a lot of things about Brahma, Abraham. Like Abraham was, Abraham's uh, father uh, was uh, Tira in the Old Testament. He came from a place called Ur and that's like uh, you are, and and, and nobody yep. really knows where that is. It's supposed to be in Persia. Is it further east? Yes, well, yes, so there's a, and there's a lot of parallels mm -hmm. between the stories of you know Brahma and Saraswati, which predate <laughs> uh, Judaism by I, I think like over at least a couple of thousand years. So well, yeah. if you think about it too, with uh, supposedly it was a whisper in Abraham's ear, pre. Uh, Hebrew religion was polytheistic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was the quote founder of the monotheistic religion. So it, there's your parallel. I mean, it was probably brought over from the East, you know, possibly Hinduism. And he had a whisper in his ear. <laughs> Last time I did it, put me in the hospital. Oh. <laughs> and, and he also went after he conquered Mecca. He went and he destroyed all the idols that were there. Yeah. We were talking about that before, but the, the Kaaba, the Kaaba had all of the pagan idols in it. Exactly, and I mm -hmm. said just the same thing a few months ago, and everybody's like, "Oh my God, this is terrible! This is, this is they're destroying history and blah blah blah." Okay, well, they're destroying history. Very, very, very sad. But what Muhammad did was even worse. Not only he did not leave anything for future historians to mm -hmm. see like, what the origin of that particular place of worship. Like, you can't go there. And if you're not a Muslim, you cannot even go in that city. So, like, today, they not only destroyed all the archaeological evidence of there being anything other than... Islam in that region, um, he also destroyed diversity. I'm not saying that pre-Islamic Arabia was like the epitome of pluralism and human rights and whatnot, <laughs> but at least it had more, slightly more tolerance than Islam could ever afford. So you had those things, and then there is also a meteorite. No, I mean, we don't know that. Well, sure, we but... don't know that for sure. Anywhere where where you have the liberty to have your tribal god represented in the common place of worship, that is more diverse than what Islam would ever say. So that was one thing that did happen in Arabia, in Mecca, that you can uh, have all of those um, uh, gods that you believe in. Uh, of, of course, the size of the god at the particular location in the place of in the common place of worship would vary according to your political power. But the fact that you could have more than one god and not the same god as the other tribe speaks a lot about the idea of acceptance. At least there was a way to do that. Now, um, for for um, speaking of Mecca, one more thing is that um, they have this. Uh, 
the stone, the story says that it fell from the sky and it's uh, it formed paradise. And if you touch it, yeah, if you touch it, all of your sins are washed away. A lot of people think that it's actually a meteorite because it actually looks like one too. It's black and it's very, very hard and that. But they are never well, going Hadro to... Well, Aswad means the black stone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they are never going to allow any scientific uh, um, studies done on that rock so we can actually know for sure that it's a meteorite. But given the way it looks and the story that goes with it, it couldn't be anything else but that um, or something um, like that. And, you know, to say to so many for like, about like 1,500 years, people are touching a meteorite. Be like, oh, you know, all my sins are going to go away. Like, it's uh, it, They've got the Blarney Stone, too. So, you know, it, it's similar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very fascinating. Religious beliefs are in, intense. <laughs> And I, to me, it's like, and I have the same beef with Christianity. It's like basically with stuff like that, you can be the biggest asshole bastard you want to be. And it's like, oh, Jesus, forgive me. Or, oh, I'm going to go touch the stone. And like, oh, now I'm all good. Yay. And then you go and be an asshole again for a few more years, you know. And, and whereas with humanism and secularism, it's like, no, if we're an asshole, then we're always an asshole and we're going to end up. You so know, restricting. I mean, that is yeah. the one thing I do miss about being young. It's like, you know, we could go to, because we lived in Saudi Arabia, so we used to do our Umrah, the, the sort of rites uh, around the, at, in Mecca, pretty much mm -hmm. as a family. And I used to look forward to it because, you know, you went there and all your sins were wiped away. So, yeah, yeah I never really had a lot of the, you know, guilt that people have, you know, when they grow well, up. They, they, the they should have learned more from the Catholics because those guys, they do the washing away, but they heap the guilt on on top of oh, it. They yes. give it yeah, yeah, yeah. weekly. Good now, balance. Sometimes uh, bi-weekly. Uh, yeah, the horror of taking responsibility off your actions. The it was nice horror. when it could all get wiped away. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, oh, well, the fact that I, you know, I punched my brother in the nose last week. <laughs> That's okay. I broke mom's dish, and, and now I'm all, you know, I'm forgiven now. Yay. <laughs> God, my mom held on to a grudge. She must have missed that day in church. I guess so. <laughs> Well, let's uh, take another break. Um, it's time to hear uh, the logical fallacy for the week, and then we'll come back and chit-chat a little bit more before we wrap things up. So let's do Good. that whole green share thing again. Excellent. Uh, fix my makeup. Yep, yep. Fix, fix, your, uh, fix your makeup there and powder your nose and all of that fun stuff. <laughs> Yeah. And now it's time for logical fallacies for dummies. <laughs> On this week's logical fallacy for dummies, I'm going to talk about the ad hominem fallacy. Pardon my French, but you're an asshole. One of the most prevalent, if not the prevalent, logical fallacy found on the internet and in debates and political speeches worldwide. The logical fallacy of ad hominem occurs when the person speaking is being attacked other than the ideas they may be presenting. It happens happens everywhere and the internet is one of the favorite places for people to use ad hominem because they appear to be anonymous they can hide behind a pseudonym and they don't have to face the person they're insulting right in front of them so they tend to be more harsh and say things they may not otherwise say where the fallacy comes in is the ideas being presented really don't have anything to do with the person presenting them. So by insulting the person, you're really not discrediting what their ideas are by any stretch. You're only trying to make them look bad and hope that people will just assume that if they're a bad person, their ideas must be bad too. But that just doesn't follow. You need to discredit the idea on its own merit and not just because you don't like or don't think anyone else should like the person speaking. The clips that I have will illustrate this. The insults being levied are of nothing to do with the ideas being presented. It's purely there to try and make the person presenting the ideas look bad. Take a listen. 
college co-ed Susan Fluke, who goes before a congressional committee and essentially says that she must be paid to have sex. What does that make her? It makes her a slut, right? Makes her a prostitute. She wants to be paid to have sex. She's having so much sex, she can't afford the contraception. She wants you and me and the taxpayers to pay her to have sex. What does that make us? We're the pimps. Boiling point today in question period. Environment Minister Peter Kent chided the NDP's Megan Leslie for missing an international environment conference. If she had been in Durban, would have seen... Trouble is, the government had blocked opposition MPs from attending as part of the Canadian delegation. It was too much for one Liberal MP. Uh, I called him a piece of uh, uh, excrement. It was in such poor faith that he did that. Uh, I lost my cool. This is right-wing Christian radio host Rick Wiles. Let's listen. I don't know what it will take for the U.S. military and intelligence community leadership to wake up and realize that an Islamic jihadist is in the White House. As American citizens, we no longer have protection from the Muslims because they have infiltrated Washington and put one of themselves in the White House. Why do you think Jihad Berry did not attend the massive march of people in Paris along with all the other world leaders? It's because he is for the jihadists. He's not against them. Barack Obama is a Muslim jihadist. I hate you. You don't think God is real because you're gay and stupid. Why don't you stop being gay and stupid and go have sexy time? I bet you have sex with monkeys because evolution says so, Mr. Gay and Stupid. Ha ha, bitch. No, you are not an atheist. You are a gay theist. Lol, lol. They should call you Richard Dickens because you're so busy sucking off Bill Maher and those Labour Party dipshits. You can't do anything else. Oh, and your science books are shit. Not as shit as God delusion. Dude, it was so poorly written, it was a waste of toilet paper, motherfucker. So, first up, we have our friend Rush Limbaugh going on about Sandra Fluke. We can't even get her name right. Ugh. So she's the lawyer that testified before Congress about the need for contraception to be covered in health insurance. What Limbaugh is doing here is twisting her argument around. He's saying that she must be having so much sex that she's a slut and can't afford to actually pay for birth control, which, of course, is utter bullshit. He's just trying to discredit her valid arguments about why contraception should have been covered under health insurance. Nice one, Rush. Next is a great one from Canadian politics from 2011. Our now leader of the opposition, Justin Trudeau, uh, got into a bit of a kerfluffle there, and he went and called the other member of parliament a piece of shit. He didn't come out and say, hey, that other member couldn't go because the government forbade her to go, and you should know that. No, he just lost his cool and screamed that he was a piece of shit across the House of Commons. Real good there, Justin. Then we have a fellow by the name of Rick Wiles who's saying that Barack Obama is a Muslim jihadist. Yeah, that's real believable. I had to actually listen to it a couple of times before I realized that Jihad Barry was Wiles' nickname for Obama. Really? Yeah, highly ineffective. And last but not least, we have some of the, quote, love letters that were sent to Richard Dawkins, and he's reading them aloud. The person that he's reading doesn't have anything to say about why Dawkins might be wrong, other than to call him names and say that, you know, he likes to fuck monkeys and whatever. Even if Dawkins did actually fuck monkeys, that wouldn't make his information about evolution wrong. It wouldn't make his science wrong. Because having sex with animals doesn't necessarily mean that your facts are incorrect. It just means that you need to go on more dates with people. Oh, and I do want to point out 
that I, of course, do not think that being gay is a bad thing, but, you know, it's Christian logic, so they don't really understand these things. If they managed to do their homework, they would know that Dawkins is a well-known LGBT ally, so calling him gay probably doesn't even insult him. In fact, judging by the way they were laughing, I think we can be pretty confident in saying that he wasn't insulted in the least. Either way, nothing here that was said does anything to discredit the ideas. The biology is still sound whether you think Dawkins likes to have sex with monkeys or not. It's irrelevant. So those using ad hominem are seeking to do two things. They're seeking to distract the target of their abuse from the argument, spending time defending their character, spending time refuting the stupid things that are being said about them, and then maybe they'll lose traction in the actual debate going on or the discussion. And of course, as I said earlier, the second thing they're trying to do is make that person look bad. So hopefully anyone who's watching or listening to the discussion will just dismiss those comments out of hand and decide that that person doesn't know what they're talking about. Of course, if they did their homework or actually read something, they would know that those things don't even matter. A person can be a horrible person and still be right in a discussion or argument. It absolutely happens all the time. Even people that you don't like can be right. That's just the way it goes. So that's why using an ad hominem is just silly. It might feel good for a few seconds, but it's not going to get you any further in an argument. Thanks for listening, and that was this week's Illogical Fallacy for Dummies. <laughs> you enjoyed that, did you, Beth? <laughs> yeah, that's... I know. I, I've got to be wearing off on you, Rick Wild. <laughs> yeah, who is that guy? I have no idea who he is. Oh, um, trust me, you're not missing anything. But he I, is. I could... he, he he's part of the right, as I call them, the extreme extreme right wing. Uh, the uh, that want the theocracy. They want to bring Sharia law to the United States. Although they have no clue what they're doing, but yeah, he he's a piece of work. But Rush Limbaugh, hey, that was a really good ad hominem, man. Like, yeah, he. he you know yeah. Your argument is started... valid because you're a slut. Yeah. <laughs> How the hell does that work? But and yeah. the and the Justin Trudeau one that was uh, epic, of course, too. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. The Dawkins love letter, so. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, yeah. That was great. I, I just find it I find it comical that when it, people disagree, the first thing they think of is to call them gay. And yeah. uh, I, I mean, I am. I'm a lesbian. I mean, I have been my entire life. So I just, it's annoying as hell, especially if you consider, you know, now we got some lawyer out in California that wants to execute all hom homosexuals, you know, shoot them in the head. Seems to be a daily occurrence lately, but it's just and knowing that about you know about Dawkins that he is you know a friend of the LGBT community. When I first saw that clip when he put that out on uh, YouTube, I just, I just had a laugh because it's like you're calling like you said in the piece stuff. You're calling somebody that supports <laughs> gay, and he's probably like, yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like if somebody called me gay, I'd be like, oh, okay, cool. Do I get an extra seat at Pride now? Like, <laughs> you know, I just, uh, I don't understand it's these people. It's so funny, like, how a lot of straight men don't like sluts. Like, why wouldn't you? <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's it, 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 sex for you. What's wrong with you? <laughs> exactly. Hello. When I was younger, yeah, when I when I was good, an adolescent, I was found it strange. I'm like, you know, that we start using words like slut and whore for women. It's going to discourage them from, you know, uh, being promiscuous, and that's not something that helps me. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah. I mean, it, I don't know. It's that whole Madonna whore thing that they can't seem to get figured oh, yeah. out. 
Ugh. Memo. But yes, the good old ad hominem. I've been called some really. Actually, when when I first sort of started to be active online was actually back in like 2006 and podcasts didn't exist back then but uh, at least not very many of them but I belonged to a Yahoo group that was run by a bunch of fundamental Christians and mm. it was an, it was an everything goes group so you, we would insult the shit out of each other but the Christians would come up with the nastiest things and so what I started doing because it was email and you had your signature line so every insult that they gave me I would add it to my signature line at the end so then they were you know I get you know, like oh I don't have that one in my collection thanks and I'd add it on and like all right and, yeah. and they were it, you know, it just it took the wind right out of it because you know I thought it was great. That's like, you do I think that's that's the only thing. You do. At one point, uh, I was also like, Ew. when I when I was really really going all out, like way back a couple of years ago, I was I was getting all of these insults, and I was like, yeah, I am a Hindu Zionist, lesbian, <laughs> um, atheist, ex-Muslim, Pakistani. What are you gonna do about it? <laughs> Western agent. A sell out to uh uh to Uncle Tom. Oh my God! Like it's it's you know your Pakistani conspiracy theorists they can come up with some oh, yeah, pretty I, interesting well, just them. I've been, and engaging uh, theories. It's it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, like uh, Fe oh, yeah. both Vessel Matar, both Vessel Matar and I uh, have been called Uncle Toms by white people, and I always thought what that was incredibly entertaining. So uh, you know all these things like. They happen. You whenever someone does that, you know they're running out of arguments. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, and that's what it comes down to. They, they either are out of arguments or they never had one to begin with. Yeah. What's also What's also interesting is that um, these people seem to think that in order to have an opinion, you must be funded by CIA. I'm like, I wish, <laughs> I wish that because like I'd be making shitloads of money just for like. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, for them to say that the reason you left Islam or the reason you reject Islam and don't believe in patriotism and things like that is because uh, America is paying you. I'm like, it's, 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 just, it's just like... Yeah, wow. paying you off, you live in Canada. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's so, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. There are a lot of folks. Do you think the conspiracy theorists in the U.S. are crazy? Just wait till you hear some of the theories Pakistanis come up with. I have not heard that yet, so oh. that would be fun. Although, uh, what was it uh, a couple of weeks ago I found uh, in my Facebook messages uh, under other um, because it had been sitting there for a few days, but somebody called me uh, the Antichrist Killer of Worlds. I thought that was pretty epic, so I was like, hey, thanks, man. <laughs> That's fine. You can go with that. I just get told to go die. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, just, yeah, I get told, I'm a, you're just a hater of religion. I'm like, yeah. And, uh, yeah, 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 I'm like, okay, and that's supposed to insult me how? Tell me something about the know. KKK and racism, and you know. Yeah. I, I have been called. I have been called a racist and Islamophobe on Twitter a couple of times, and I was like, "Yeah, okay." Um, so, what race is Islam exactly? Because I've seen all kinds of folks that are Muslims. So, what what race is that? Yeah, exactly? that that's so. That's the thing. I and I've, I've I've said this before too. Is that if you're saying that you know being criticizing Islam is racist, then you're automatically assuming that all of Islam is a race. What does yes, that? Yeah. What does that make you? If you take yeah. like 1.6 billion people and you're considering them all to be like one race, that you can be racist against. That makes you racist. So. Yep. Uh, yeah. My favorite one was a guy on Twitter who called me a racist, and I was like, um, "Okay, well, if that you know, whatever. I don't believe." that, you're stupid, whatever, and he's like, well, I've now humiliated you. I'm like, no, no, you haven't. Yes, I have. I've humiliated you as a racist. I'm like, it, this is me not caring. And and then he is like, no, humiliation means that, that someone else thinks you're bad. I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure it means that I think I'm bad, and I don't. And, and this whole, like, 
you know, I, I think it went over like a day and a half of, of sporadic messaging. He was like, I have humiliated you. I'm like, you're just an idiot. <laughs> that is a point, I think, to Lishma's point earlier, is when an ad hominem is <coughs> somehow yeah. um, justified, possibly. It's like when you when you just have like that kind of repetition. Or effective, or effective. Well, I, yeah. I, I find it most effective in like, you know, it, a lot of a lot of civilized debates and you can be like, okay, that's a very incredible that's an incredibly stupid thing to say. Why would you say such a stupid thing when you're such an intelligent person? Those uh, yeah. things like you know, yeah. the shit sandwich works. Like no matter what anybody tells you, shit sandwich always works. <laughs> uh, well if you're saying yeah. That is that idea is stupid. You're not necessarily saying that that person is stupid. You're saying you've just said something that's really dumb. So yeah. what's your excuse for that? Or can you make that a little less dumb? You know that that's yeah. a little bit different. Yeah, you, you have all these arguments about tone and you know what kind of tone you should use, and mm -hmm. I find that another sort of a distractionary thing. You know when people want to deflect from the the discussion. Um, yeah. Happening is, you know, because the, the, the tone is really like different tones work on different people. You look at the civil rights movement. Rosa Parks didn't say a word. She just sat on a bus and refused to move. Martin Luther King was more of a diplomat. He's more interested in outreach. Chose yep. his words carefully. Um, Malcolm X was just pretty much militant. And he's like, you know, fuck this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say what I'm going to say. And he was very angry. So, and all of those, uh, all of those approaches have their place. I mean, there is yes. a. I, I see this a lot with. A lot of the, uh, uh, I guess, uh, you know, a lot of the sort of younger atheists that I meet, you know, they're like, well, you know, Dawkins' his approach, he's a little, he's become a little too militant now. He's become a little too aggressive now. No. Was, you have a short memory. 2002, <laughs> when you guys didn't even have pubic hair, um, you know, this guy did a TED Talk called The Case for Militant Atheism. And uh, his, his earlier books were just as, you know, they, they were just as strident, if they, they call him strident, and just as harsh, and he's pretty much the same thing, and his approach worked on you way back when. Now exactly. you come over to the other side, and you're looking back and saying... Uh, exactly. You know, it's... Uh, it's so hindsight isn't yeah. always twenty twenty. It's just not. Absolutely. And I, that's the yeah. thing that gets me about Dawkins, and he has not changed. No, yeah, and I don't at all. get... People yeah. are saying, oh, well, he's so mean now, and blah, blah. No, he's the same as he... And I think he's very soft-spoken and very sensitive most of the time. Yeah, I, I think so, too. I find it really, uh, you know, he's, he gets accused of racism. Sam Harris gets accused of racism. And all these, but, um, <laughs> that I always find comical. I know, I mean, I... I Sam been, Harris. They've been very good to me. You know, I've, uh, you know, I've had interactions with them. I've met both of them, and uh, yep. they've, been very, they've been very supportive of uh, the ex-Muslim community, the majority of whom are not white people. Um, yeah. And they, they really, well, I mean, they've brought a lot of attention uh, to their voices. Uh, so I, I think that, I, I mean, a lot of these uh, groups, like a lot of the ex-Muslim groups, um, and I don't necessarily identify as an ex-Muslim, even though I'm happy to take on the label, um, but uh, because I don't feel like I, I prefer born-again atheists. Or born yeah. again, but <laughs> the, uh, but I, I actually, you know, I, I think a lot of them do have a lot of prominence, and they're known now because uh, these people really helped it along. It really helped. Yeah. Them. Well, well, that's where it comes down to. Is I mean, when I, if I would have read Dawkins back when I was first deconverting from Christianity, I probably would have changed overnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Instead of taking ten fucking years. Yeah. I and I I mean Yeah, if I would have if I would have read God Delusion, it probably would have been overnight. And I know people who have who 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 have decided, well, God doesn't exist, that's that, and then they go on with it. Yeah, I that, know people who have yeah, that would be you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like you know, for people like me who, you know, it took a long time, and I did it solitary. It was, you know, I started in in eighty nine, and it took me till almost nineteen ninety mm -hmm. before I even admitted to myself I was an atheist. I mean, I went through the whole agnostic phase and <clears throat> atheist agnostic or agnostic atheist, and then eventually I'm like, you know what? 
I finally said it. You know, it, it took me a good ten years before I even admitted to myself, and then to actually tell people. That was probably another two years. Mm -hmm. I've uh, I think for me the when the God Illusion came out, it was an affirmation because you know until then <laughs> exactly sort of like trolling my relatives and saying stuff to, you know, my friends and stuff and just pissing them off. <laughs> like, you know, I, I just thought I was the only annoying person who secretly thought that all of this stuff was bullshit. And then when it came out, and, you know, I before that, like when I was 14, 15, my cousin had a whole collection of Bertrand Russell books. So I did read <laughs> I just found yeah. uh, what I liked about the, the God Delusion is that it... You know, the God Delusion had all the same arguments. I think he he wrote it in a very nice. I mean, Dawkins is still a great writer. He always was one of the, the best out there, um, just in terms of how well he articulates himself and how clear he is with his writing. Um, so as a writer, I really appreciate him. But uh, when he mm -hmm. when he wrote the God Delusion, I was just like, this is just the, the clarity in this and the and and the flow and everything. It, it's so good that and, and what he did was he kind of was uh, made the same case that Bertrand Russell did. In a very assertive, mm -hmm. in a way that kind of uh, was empowering. That okay, you know, we can actually talk about this. We can actually have this conversation. And I think it just, uh, sort of um, changed everything. Because before well, that, it was kind of yeah, yeah. It was it was a slap in the face. Whereas you know, in Bertrand Russell's time, you know, in in his heyday, I mean, you couldn't be outspoken. Yeah. Whereas now, I think there. I, I don't know if tolerance is the right word, but now you can be. I mean, yeah, you're going to get some backlash. I mean, I'm still not, I mean, hell, I'm 50 years old. I'm not even out to my family. Mm -hmm. And at my mom's funeral, just before Thanksgiving, I actually came out to one of my cousins. Mm -hmm. And that raised a few eyebrows. So it'll be interesting when I go home and see Dad this weekend, because I'm pretty sure they probably said something. But yeah. it, it never came up, and it was really none of their business. Yeah, that's... Uh, I mean... You know, it, it, my parents, my dad was on my 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 other Facebook page and not thinking, because um, I have two different ones uh, for for safety issues. And I had put on there that I was an atheist, so I mean, it's not like I was hiding it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm, it, it's same thing with with my sexuality. I've never hidden it. It's just never come up in conversation. Yeah. I figure once you hit 24, 25, if they haven't figured it out by then, <laughs> if they haven't figured it out by the time I was 50, we got a problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, for me, like I, like I said, I just, I just, I, it was a light bulb moment for me. I was like, poof, like, wow, God, the whole God thing is bullshit. All right, then. Enough with the church shit. <laughs> Right, and I mean, like the, yeah. before that, I was like the the rabid Christian telling my eight year old brother to repent or he was gonna go to hell kind of thing, and yeah. it just kind of like poof. And I was like, because you guys probably know get the sense of that too. It's like we're in a happy little bubble up here. No one really gives a shit, you know, if you're yeah. if you're an atheist or not for the most part. And I was happy little atheist not doing anything about it or anything for 17 years before I ever even heard of Dawkins. I was like, there's a book, like, somebody's writing about how God isn't real. Damn, I need to find out about this guy. Like, hey. And, and it has nothing to do with it. And it, it stymies people that I've debated because they like to try, oh, you're one of those, you know, you follow Dawkins as your God or Harris as your yeah. God or whatever. And I'm like... Actually, I'd never even heard of them until I'd been an atheist half my life. Um, no, that's, that's the thing. Same here. I think, you know, when it came out, what it made, uh, what it did for me was more, it was an affirmation. I'm like, oh, so you can talk about it this way. Cause, yes. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing is, like, I always find I relate more to the anti-theist position. I, I, I think it is better to be in opposition to something. Like, and I, I've given this, I give this example to Joe Rogan as well as, that, um, you know, with the feminist movement, they were opposed to patriarchy, they were opposed to gender inequality, and, you know, um, and which all of us are now. And at that point, uh, you know, they came up against a lot of opposition. So you could be anybody, and you could be a feminist if you're opposed to those things. So it was really some, a movement in opposition to something that they yeah. didn't want to see anymore in society. The moment yeah. it started becoming for something, like, you know, you're only a feminist if you're pro-choice, you're only a feminist if you're a liberal... Then that's when the fragmentation starts, and I, I think it's like that with with atheism too. Is that 
Well, you you were talking with Joe Rogan about the A A plus thing too. Yeah, I I actually uh, yeah. That was I, like the worst thing I had. Like it's horrible. I'm just like that, that. I think you know that was that was the point where I realized that if I want a community, I'm not going to have a community based on something that I don't believe so, in. Right? Like this is like I don't believe in a god, so I don't think that that's the, an enough thing for me to have uh, the, to have a, a group of people like to for me to associate with everybody or anybody who says that I don't believe in a god. I'm like that's that's not cool. Which is why like a lot of the times people are like, well, you are vocal, you are vocal. Time you still go to your uh, um, previous sex. Uh, a religious uh, um, uh, building, and you just do those things yeah, too. Thing. And I'm like, because they have never given. They most of those people know that I'm an atheist. They've mm -hmm. never kicked me out. They've mm -hmm. never forced so, me to do so anything that I didn't want to do. And yeah. I have a lot more in common with those people, especially when it comes to diversity. Like if I go to any of the atheist meetups, they're not going to talk about. The songs or the language that or the literature that I grew up reading, um, apart from anything that was an English language, they're not gonna have that kind of food that we used to have in uh, during our gatherings. Or our uh, we did not need alcohol to dance and to be really really happy and to go pretty nuts. It was just you know sense of community, friends and family, and that was enough. Uh, and we didn't need to be drunk out of our minds. So all of those things were there, and I yeah. miss those things. And if it's not, it's not, you know, it's just one of those things, uh, one of the blessings of being an atheist that I can do whatever the hell I want, and I can go to any ceremony that I want because I'm not. You can be an atheist if you're still gonna go enjoy those cultural things. Well, hell yeah, I can. I can still be an atheist, not believe in. The bullshit, but still enjoy the free food. I can do that. And so, uh, just to be clear, the A plus <laughs> thing was. Uh, it just so the the A plus thing was when they said that atheism comes with a social agenda, right? Something yes. like that. Yes. Where yes. you yes. have to be yeah. have certain attributes. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I was getting at. I think that when it starts standing for something, then you get fragmentation. Whereas if it just stands in opposition. To bad or stupid ideas, if that that's all it is, then exactly. I'm in a more comfortable position to be in, um, and I think it's 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 more honest that way. Absolutely, because absolutely, because yeah. oh, I'm getting an echo. Yeah, an echo. Oh, that's okay. Oh, that's that's okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. It, how it does that sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> we almost okay. made it a whole show. We almost show. made it a whole show. I know. I know. <laughs> Well, well, I think we're, I we're think at the end of the time anyway, so right. why don't uh, I give you guys an opportunity to tell me where everyone can find you, where they can learn more about what you guys are doing, because I know Ali's got a clip on the way, and we should go to the table stuff, so what do you guys do for you? I'm, uh, well, I'm on Twitter, it's uh, A-L-I-A-M-J-A-D-R-I-Z-V-I, that's Ali M. Jadrizvi. Um, and I am also I'm writing a book uh, which is called The Atheist Muslim. That's a working title. So there's a lot happening with that, and that's uh, we're hoping to get it out in about a year. And it actually talks it it, it is a lot about what we were saying about the uh, ideology and identity and the crossroads um, and in between. So you know that's 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 basically me. Um, I'm on Twitter. It's uh, secularly yours. Um, I have deactivated my blog for uh, some reasons, um, but that's where people can reach me. You can also find me on Facebook, Alish Bazarmin, and you can follow me. Um, and uh, if you do send me a friend request, please, please introduce yourself by sending me a <laughs> message first because it becomes very difficult for me to distinguish. You know, to, to accept people, so that's the thing. But the best way to um, interact with me would be Twitter. Um, if you don't know me, and you can just follow me. Oh. I also blog on Faisal Madar's uh, Facebook blog, Glo Global Secular Humanist Movement. So I also post over there. So if you just want to go over there and hit like, and then you'll get 
um, updates from a, we are about six editors on the blog now, so you'll get this. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, and I, I also write for my HuffPost archive. I was going to say. I was say. Gonna say. Cool. Cool. I forgot because it's, it's either CIA and Mossad pay me, but HuffPost <laughs> doesn't pay me shit. So I just wanted to. No, I'm um, I love okay. HuffPost. Um, so yeah, and I also also I've uh, uh, yeah so the HuffPost archive and, 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 and he's got this he's got this band thing going on too. I do. I have a band called Dead Shire. It's like dead as in D E A D and Shire is S H Y R E, and um, we just played I think two Saturdays ago. That's at right. The That's right. And Deb, you were there, and you know we had a good time. And I on Monday, I had a little bit of laryngitis. I was recovering from it, and now I'm a lot better. By Falsetto is coming back slowly, and yeah. we have a yeah, that was a fun night. That was and fun we night. are on Facebook. Uh, we have a five song EP uh, that came yeah. out yeah. a little while ago. You know that you can actually get on iTunes. You can stream it on Spotify or whatever. So it's a uh, hard rock music, and it's a lot of fun. It's very good. It's very and, good. Awesome. And Beth, Beth, hi, you. You, you didn't make it through the whole show last week, so I had to kind of plug you on your behalf. So. Oh. <laughs> um, easiest um, way, way. Twitter, Twitter. At Dune. At Dune. Nine, 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 eight. That connects that to my blog, blog and blog. Facebook and all that stuff. All that stuff. Awesome. Yeah, and yeah, that's and a that's a terrific blogger. blogger. The, the <laughs> finding all kinds all of kinds of prizes and batches and batches. So uh, <laughs> there's a, a lot of them lot down of in the neck of the woods, unfortunately, and she can she can keep it all good. All good. That's great. Uh, awesome. Well, thank awesome. you, well, thank you guys for so joining us. us. It was great talking to you. Great talking to you. Learned a few Learned things. A few yeah. things. Over. Thank you for having us. It was fun. You're welcome. Let us know when you're up in the. Thank the you. Sea Thank again. you. Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, I don't know. I don't know. There's by things happening. There's a lot of on the on the center was posted. Yeah. Looks like it could be. Oh. Is that you guys? You guys? No, I don't think so. Okay. Let's clear it up. I think. Yeah, thank. Oh, oh, that's her character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but again, thank again, you, and uh, you know, maybe I'll do this again sometime. sometime. So yeah. I'm going to close out the close out show. The show. I'll, I'll do with, with her friend. Her friend. Because he is in his ministry. I know the true, true, true talk of the and rational thinking, 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 and I will use them to my advantage. I know the truth and power of educating myself and of expanding my intellectual boundaries, and I will educate myself. I know the truth and power of vanquishing ignorance, and I will do so whenever the opportunity presents itself. I know the truth and power of morality without supervision and of true and accurate righteousness. I know the truth and power of obliterating tyranny, be it intellectual, emotional, or philosophical, and will work toward that goal whenever and however possible. I know the truth and power of human ingenuity. I know the truth and power of human compassion, and I will be mindful of the welfare of others. I know the truth and power of equality and fairness for all living things. I know the truth and power of the importance of our families, our friends, and our fellow men and women. I know the truth and power of human stewardship of our lands, our waters, and our skies. And I will try to act to preserve our environment. I know the truth and power of the sciences of mathematics, of physics, and of chemistry and of the important role of these disciplines in understanding the workings of this cosmos. I know the truth and power of the rejection of all notions or beliefs that reside in the supernatural or the superstitious. 
and of those notions or beliefs that we are not supposed to be able to explain. And I know that these rejections are necessary for humankind's survival. I am a human being with a free mind, liberated from irrational influence and from unreasonable dogma.